Thank you, Shari. I'm for hope. I want to cheer up the minister. Um, but I got a bit of a shock um, th this morning when I was reading through my paper, which I had delivered by electronically to Joe, and it's now in the August archives, and I found a desperate typo. I was quoting the theme of this summer school, um, Ireland at the Crossroads, and I'd written, Ireland at the Crosswords. <laughs> But then I thought to myself, maybe that's not too inappropriate because there are plenty of crosswords have been exchanged when people are talking about mental health. And in fact, mental health and mental health services, to me, often seems like a big puzzle. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the puzzling aspects. But there's no doubt that mental health does generate a lot of controversy and generates a lot of deeply held, entrenched, diametrically opposed views uh, about the, the issue. And we're well used to the concept of polarity in mental illness, um, psychiatry. We talk about bipolar disorder as part of the vernacular, a, a very serious mental condition uh, in which there's uh, alternating um, mania with uh, um, uh, behavior which is out of control and uh, perhaps grandiose delusions. That alternates with the depression. But bipolar disorder is not the only polarity that we come across in mental health. There are lots of them and I'm going to address some of them um, later on, but I'll just mention them first. First of all, what is normality and what is illness? What should be treated and what should not? What should be treated medically and what should be treated non-medically? Whether we should focus on the needs of the individual or the needs of society. Regarding the individual, should we give more emphasis to the autonomy, freedom rights of the individual or their right to be treated compulsorily if necessary? And then which is better, the public or the private system? So in this paper, I'm going to try and address some of these polls, and I'm going to argue that mental health is very difficult to define. I'll talk a bit about that. I want to talk particularly about that we shouldn't medicalize human distress, and Mary mentioned that, and I'll give my version of that. I don't think we're too far apart. We should foster resilience and coping. Our future should lie in the separation of services into those with a medical component and those without. And all services, of course, should be individualized with the service user at the center of all deliberations. Mental health is difficult to define, and in areas of great controversy, it's usually due to the fact that there's no consensus on the definition. And what is mental health? What is even health? Yeah, the word health itself comes from an old English word which means soundness or whole. The ancient Greeks regarded health as a divine uh, gift, and so did the Quran, actually. And in fact, when you think of it, health ourselves, people go around trying to look after their health, their physical health, and yet they get sick and, and get cancer, etc. So it does seem to be random. So maybe it is a divine gift. But the best known definition is probably that of the WHO. And Ian has already spoken about how WHO definitions can be a little bit uh, unrealistic. This is an example, I think, of an unrealistic definition of the WHO in 1948. A complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of of disease or infirmity. But that's not really a helpful definition. It describes probably more accurately what we might call happiness. And I'm not sure if we believe in happiness because when I grew up in the 50s and 60s at school, I was taught that this life was a veil of tears. <laughs> and we should expect to struggle and suffer. And even if you do believe in happiness, I don't think you can know what happiness is until you know what unhappiness is and sadness. I mean, how can you be happy if you haven't experienced the opposite? There's a very good um, author, James Davies. He wrote a book called um, The Importance of Suffering. And he argues that suffering can have meaning. It can help us understand ourselves and make us richer and more rounded people. He says, regarding suffering as a pathology to be eliminated is counterproductive and takes away our independence of thought and actually dilutes and diminishes us, dilutes our integrity. The Buddhists also have a similar view of suffering. But similarly, you can't know depression, or you can't know elation without depression, sanity without insanity, or peace without agitation. We all know that the, the, the negative emotions, I think, are intrinsic and important to our lives. In fact, I think we'd be lesser species if we didn't experience depression, if we didn't, when things went wrong, didn't withdraw, retrench, go into pensive mode, try to figure out where we went wrong and make plans for the future. I think that's uh, evolutionary, from an evolutionary perspective, that has great utility and great usefulness. Anxiety, similarly, 
is helpful, that it helps us um, actually identify the risks and actually it helps performance. A certain amount of anxiety is necessary to get maximal performance. Okay, if you have too much anxiety, performance will suffer. Similarly, psychosis or madness, as people refer to it increasingly recently, um, is it may have a, a utility uh, uh, to us as a species. Um, the poet John Dryden, many of you may know this, this quotation, as he surmised that great wits are to madness near allied and thin partitions do their bounds divide. So there, there may well be a genetic association between creativity and psychosis. And we all know of the examples of John Nash, um, a beautiful mind who died recently, the mathematician, uh, the other, uh, Vincent van Gogh, the painter, Kay Redfield Jemison, who had bipolar disorder, who's a celebrated um, professor of um, psychiatry. She's a psychologist. And then uh, Ellen Sachs, who visited this country recently, who wrote The Centre Cannot Hold. She has uh, schizophrenia, but she's brilliant. So the, the, there may well be an advantage in these negative, what we might regard as negative emotions. They're part of our human condition. So let's just talk about what is uh, mental illness, mental disorder, mental disease or infirmity. All these terms are used sort of interchangeably. The United States National Institute of Mental Health in 2005 estimated that 26.2% of all American adults suffered from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. Um, so that, that figure, as you know, is quoted almost on a daily basis on the radio, in the newspapers. Uh, it's, it's been quoted uh, already. Uh, today it will be quoted many times. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of schizophrenia, the lifetime prevalence is thought to be no more than 1 in 100. And let's take the other, what might be called very serious mental conditions. Bipolar disorder would be similar. Melancholic depression, the really serious depression, uh, would be similar. Uh, disabling anxiety and serious personality disorders. So if you add all those up, you're talking about five and 100 approximately um, over a lifetime, which is a lot different to one in four uh, in a year. So obviously we're talking about something different. In the early part of the 20th century, when psychiatric classification began, there were about a handful of disorders, probably those disorders I mentioned earlier. In the 1950s then, the American Psychiatric Association published the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the first version of it, and it had uh, 106 diagnoses. They were psychiatric diagnoses, mental disorders, mental illnesses. The second one rose to 182, and the third to 265. DSM-4 was published, I think, somewhere in the 90s, and they, that increased the number of diagnoses to 370. And the DSM-5, uh, which was published last year, uh, has a similar number, but it, it made up uh, I say that uh, advisedly, 15 new disorders, including caffeine withdrawal, <laughs> and, and, uh, which you're probably all experiencing now, actually. I just thought of that. <laughs> so you all have a mental illness. You're now one of the one in, part of the one in four that have a mental disorder this year, this day, actually. Um, but really, uh, this is, uh, it, it seems funny, but we, surely we haven't evolved into a different species. We're the same people we were 100 years ago, and human nature hasn't changed that much. So it's clear that everyday ups and downs have now been reclassified as illness. Uh, and, of course, the implication here is quite sinister, or maybe sinister, as Davies points out in another book that you, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, I'd better tell you what it is. It's, uh, it's cracked why psychiatry does more harm than good. Uh, and, uh, but his implication is that diagnoses are made up so they can be treated. And what are they treated with except medications? So there is a sort of a sinister element to all of this. But let me get back to the one and four. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the journalist and author, Sathnam Sangira. He wrote a book called The Boy with the Top Knot, A Memoir of Love, Secrets and Lies in Wolverhampton. He grew up in Wolverhampton as a Punjabi Sikh and uh, had a, a difficult childhood. He went on to become a journalist in London. And then he was contemplating, focusing on his childhood, and he went back to live in Wolverhampton uh, for two years. He particularly focused on, though, his father and his sister, who had very severe schizophrenia. And he went into great detail. He studied um, schizophrenia, and he described in, in great detail and very uh, poignantly his life and how his parents, uh, how his father and sister were affected by it and how the family were affected by them having the illness. And he wrote a very trenchant article in the Times of London about, I'd say about seven or eight years ago, uh, on the notion that one in four of us suffer from a mental disorder that was quite prevalent at the time. And he said that most of these disorders bear no resemblance to the severity of thought disorder behavior that he witnessed in his own family. He was of the view that that type of statistic serves to sanitize, attempts to sanitize mental illness and does not address the reality 
of the most severe subtypes. It may even have the effect of, to, of depriving these mental of these serious illnesses of resources and even banishing their sufferers from sight. He thought that might be the effect. The, you notice the word, he used the word sanitize there. Interesting, if you look at the origin of the word uh, sane, which comes from the word health in, um, in, uh, in Latin, I think. Another aspect of this uh, one and four is that the, um, the United, in the United States, the Community Mental Health Acts of 1963 set up a network of community mental health centers all across the country. This was in association with the closing of the big psychiatric institutions, which was happening just at the end of the 50s and the 60s. And the idea was that with the closure of these institutions, the former residents would now be served in the community. So there were beautiful buildings that were set up in every downtown. But in fact, what they did attract was the worried well, who clogged up the services. The people with the serious illnesses who had been in hospital uh, would not have been as motivated to get uh, access perhaps because of institutionalization over many years, and many of them ended up under bridges or else moving to California. And those of you who visited San Diego um, or will visit San Diego will notice the, the, the amount of homeless people just um, walking around. It's, it's actually quite frightening. It's not frightening for, for because of, of the homeless people, but it's frightening that, that people can be uh, treated in a, in a humane system in that way. So... I think I'm, I'm belaboring the point that the, the definition is, is, is quite elusive and it does involve many causative influences, genetic, social, developmental, moral, cultural, behavioral, and medical, each with its own set of definitions and polarities. Many of you remember Dr. Anthony Clare, and I don't know if many of you remember that he wrote a great book in 1976 called Psychiatry and Dissent, in which he outlined all the various um, different viewpoints in uh, psychiatry, the, including the anti-psychiatry movement of Thomas Satz, uh, psychotherapy, social psychiatry, and biological psychiatry. Uh, he was addressing the optimal way of defining mental health, and he quoted the first professor of psychiatry in the Institute of Psychiatry in London, Sir Aubrey Lewis. And I'll read that, this one, because it's, he puts it very uh, uh, nicely. Anyone who has reflected on the many definitions of health, and mental health in particular, will, I think, conclude that there is no consensus, and he will see that when moral or social values are involved, there are scarcely any limits to the behavior which might be called morbid. Medical criteria are safer. That is, criteria essentially concerned with the integrity of physiological and psychological functions. I'm a psychiatrist, so some of you will say, he would say that, wouldn't he? He would quote that. But I think that's a reasonable perspective. Let me talk a little bit about the trajectory of history and this summer school theme of 2016, Ireland at their crossroads, not the crosswords. Um, so, and it's 100 years on, obviously, from 1916. But when these events were taking place in the GPO, if you took a short walk, you would find yourself up at the Lunatic Asylum at Grange Gorman. And at that stage, it was 100 years old. It had been set up because the, the Richmond, where the old Richmond Hospital used to be, a house of industry or workhouse, was becoming full with what they call lunatic wards. So they opened the, um, the Lunatic Asylum in Grange Gorman. And that had been the culmination, or not the culmination yet, but it had been part of the... Um, the increase in the confinement of people who were odd or different. And this had started in the 17th, 17th century when economics became important and the importance of work was, was recognized. In the 17th century in Paris, half the population were homeless, and most of them were vagrants, vagabonds, uh, probably mentally ill, uh, criminals, etc. So Michel Foucault, who wrote the book Madness and Civilization, stated that the state needed to separate the abnormal so it could define for itself what was normal, so it was in that context that the intolerance of madness, as he puts it, flourished. From then on, there was an inexorable rise in the number of social misfits, rejects, or mad who were incarcerated. And this was progressing in 1916, but then reached its high water mark in Ireland in 1958, when we had the, the highest number of people um, incarcerated, is the right word, in mental institutions. It was tw over 21,000 at that time in private and uh, public institutions, uh, over 20,000 in public institutions. So from 1916 then, um, um, at the, the time of the, the rising, to 1958, there were no crossroads whatsoever. This was a straight road. There were no turn-offs. We were going straight to lock up more and more people with mental problems. And when I started work in, the, in psychiatry in the 1980s, um, there were 800 patients in St. Jesus Hospital in Portran. 400 of them had mental handicap and 400 had psychiatric illness. There was no community treatment other than a rudimentary outpatient clinic that we did uh, occasionally. Uh, the medications, antidepressants, antipsychotics had just become available in the 1950s. 
And with the advent of these medications, but also, I think, more importantly, and I, I've mentioned this later on, uh, social factors, political changes from the liberal 60s, which primed the reduction in the numbers of, of psychiatric institutions. Some people say it was just the meds that got people out of hospital, but I think it was more to do with the politics, as it usually is, uh, um, Minister, and the politics and social factors. Uh, then the, in Ireland we had the policy document, uh, again a political uh, document, planning for the future in 1985, which recommended that mental health treatment should take place in general hospitals and there should be more emphasis on community treatment. Similarly, in 2006 we had a vision for change, which detailed a consensus, and this was a, a, a great thing to achieve, because I said earlier consensus is very difficult to achieve in mental health, that the, the services should be conducted mainly in the community, that the services should be multidisciplinary in nature, they should be less medically focused and that the patient or service user should be at the center of the whole process in partnership with the treatment team and that the treatment should be a form of facilitation towards recovery. Um, now, actually, that reminds me a little bit of the WHO definition. You remember when it said um, you're, you're not healthy, uh, or even if you have no mental or no, no, no disease or infirmity, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily healthy. So it, it, it implies that if you have a disease or infirmity, you're definitely not healthy, which goes against the concept of recovery. So it's another bash we're having at the WHO, myself and Ian. Um, and these principles are all accepted by those in mental health, the patients, their families, advocates, service providers, and professional bodies, and everybody is on board. But then we, we all got on this bus, but we ran out of petrol a little bit in 2008, and the principles uh, were, were adopted in, in, in principle and in theory, but it was difficult for, in some areas for them to be adopted uh, in practicality. But I still think that is not a sufficient excuse. There probably wasn't sufficient buy-in from certain uh, elements of those who were involved in the, in the services. That, but uh, when I was doing inspections, I did notice that there was still a very uh, strong emphasis in some areas on a purely medicalized approach with almost exclusive use of medication, sometimes in large doses, and sometimes many different medications were seen as the only approach. And that happens when somebody is on a lot of medications, they have a, an up or a down, which may be a normal up or down, just because you have a serious mental illness or condition doesn't mean that you don't have bad days and good days and that you, your cat can die just the same as anybody else's cat. Or you can, um, you can be locked out of the house and things can go wrong. But if you happen to turn up to a clinic, you'll get more medications for that type of uh, condition. And that, that's, that was that, what was happening in some areas. And in the 1980s, there was uh, still some of the asylums were in operation, and they're nearly all gone now, except for um, Central Mental Hospital, which the minister is closing shortly, and will go to um, St. Edith's in Port Town. And that's a very, very welcome development, because these buildings were horrible in the 1980s, and they were even more horrible in the 2000s, but they closed down um, in the 2000s. And that's, that's a, a great, um, that, that was great news. And if that trajectory continues, of history, I think we're, we're going in the right direction. I just want to talk a little bit about how we might improve our mental health. Um, some people think that improvements in physical health, look at how healthy we all are nowadays compared to 100 or 150 years ago, are all due to, is due to modern medicine and the great medications we have and the great tests and the great hospitals. But in fact, uh, improvements in health were occurring because of social factors. They were occurring because we had good, clean water we had good shelter, people were, had better nutrition, they were wealthier, they had more, better nutrition, and we had better working conditions. And people, rather than working 80 hours in mines and, and getting cold, were now working 40 hours. And so th these are the, the main factors, the socio-cultural factors that accounted for, I think, for our improvement in our physical health. And medicine was an incidental and it helped, and maybe it helped, um, maybe, it, maybe in, in areas it, it didn't help. Similarly, in mental health, I don't think we should be reliant on a medical solution um, or a pseudo-medical solution. Um, um, someone's going to ask me later what that means, and it's complicated. But um, to um, our improving our mental health. I think we have to start, and Ian has touched on this, we have to start in the family. We have to make sure our children grow up and don't experience the ravages of alcoholism uh, among their parents or drug addiction. We have to, or if parents have serious mental illness, that they're well treated. Because it all starts really in the home, and you would be amazed the number of people who just have these sad lives, even below the threshold, uh, and they have their distress, of course, but they, below the threshold of illness, lead very sad, sad lives and don't cope. And if, you, and if they do happen to find their way into your office and you ask the question, you'll find there was alcoholism, there was probably sexual abuse in the family. And these are all the things that affect 
an individual's mental health and affect a community's mental health. Now, those children, they need a good home, and again, that's a political question. How do you ensure that children do get a good home? But also at school, and this is another political question, children should be taught that we're not perfect, we're, not, we're fragile enough, we have ups and downs, we will experience depression, it's not a bad thing to experience it. We, will, but we, we need to accept that, accept our suffering, accept also that we, learn to, we must learn uh, ways of being resilient and coping with these problems, ways of soothing ourselves. And they should learn that the human condition is part of, uh, it involves struggle and suffering. And those who, who grow up and do take to drugs or, or, or become alcoholics, they should have early access to rehabilitation. Sometimes if we can't help ourselves, we need to involve our friends and families. We need to reach out to be able to talk to our friends and families. And we need to accept that these everyday ups and downs are normal and not a cause. We shouldn't sort of start um, pull, uh, stating, I have a mental disorder, I'm one of the one in four. I think we should avoid making that statement. And if these everyday measures are not effective, I believe that they should be available. I think it's, it's happening, um, and it, should be hap it, it will happen more in the future, and that's a cause for hope. There should be a network of counsellors out there where people can go to as, a, as, a, as a, a, a port of first call, where you will go if your human distress is not de um, uh, dealt with adequately by your own resources, by your family's resources. Go to this non-medical network of counselling services. And then you might ask the question, then, does the medical profession have anything to offer? Some point, uh, I've been at lots of meetings where the medical model has been used as a form of insult, almost as a curse medical model, and uh, automatically then you, you had to fall back. Um, uh, psychiatrists, as you know, are medical doctors, and doctors in the medical profession are trained to identify patterns of symptoms and signs that might add up to something. And the reason why they're interested in seeing what it adds up to is because you can predict how the, the course of something, if, if you have uh, studied it over a period, you can also predict uh, what treatment might be effective. And that's a very good way of, of dealing with human condition and human problems. But it's not individualized. Many of our problems are individualized, and we need an individual explanation. So there are other um, um, partners in the, um, the medical provision of services. These are the social workers, nurses, uh, occupational therapists. And all of these, along with the psychiatrists, are, tra are, are trained to work in a team and to treat the most serious illnesses of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, melancholic depression, disabling anxiety, and the more serious personality disorders. Treatment of this category, I will argue, should be the sole remit of the professional mental health services. In other words, that's all they should do. They shouldn't be involved in lesser levels of illnesses. And these services, of course, should involve uh, as much as possible respect um, for the autonomy and the liberty rights of patients. And the current culture of blame should change such, as, such that professionals are prepared to take meaningful risks for the benefit of their patients and their quality of life. Too often you see people held in hospital for too long uh, because of the risk, oh, something might go wrong and I might get blamed for it. And the patient suffers in that situation and they're held, um, they're held um, uh, against their will uh, under the Mental Health Act. The budgets for, the, for these serious mental illnesses should be ring-fenced uh, um, and, and so should budget for the, for the human distress services or severe human distress services, we could call them. They should be ring-fenced from each other. I talked about the risk there, um, the uh, um, obsession with risk, and, and that is ba mainly boils down to the risk of suicide, and I won't go into detail on that. But psychiatrists and all mental health professionals should respect the patient's own views of their illnesses. Patients should be asked how the quality of life can be improved and how their distress can be interpreted in the context, and that's the really important word that Pat Bracken stresses. Uh, the context of their hopes, their dreams, and their aspirations. And how, how do their hopes, dreams, and aspirations relate to their current lives? Um, and it's often the case, that so we have to respect this, that sometimes people with a serious illness might have a very far-fetched explanation that might seem far-fetched to us for how they came to be, uh, how they are, and how they're going to cope with their condition. And we should accept that, because the one thing that humans do need, it seems, is some explanation for any condition. If there's an explanation there, I think it can be, it can be tolerated. So doctors in the medical profession should be less, um, 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 they should be more accepting and less authoritarian, more accepting of the, of the patient's view of their illness 
and, and not to be pushing their view necessarily. Some people like this view, that their disorder is a, is a, uh, a disorder of chemicals or neurochemistry. So I'm going to conclude now, and I, before I do so, I just want to wrap up a little bit to say that we did discuss um, how Ireland and its mental health are at a, that's where I had the typo, a crossroads. But maybe a more um, ma ma apt metaphor might be the following. Do, do any of you remember the old red cow roundabout before the, the bypass on a Friday evening? And there must be about 20 uh, exits on that, uh, on that uh, red cow roundabout. In fact, people were calling it the mad cow roundabout at that time. Do you remember that? Um, and so, in a way, our mental health services are a bit like being on that roundabout. But, but every signpost, every exit has um, mental health or, or improving our mental, good mental health is on every signpost of every poll, if you want to keep the metaphor going, um, on every exit of that roundabout. So we're going round in circles, or we were going round in circles. Um, and it's, the way to get out of that circle of hell, I would suggest, is the following. So we must not medicalize human suffering or distress, but we must find some way of rediscovering our sense of community and individual resilience to find meaning and purpose in our lives. When human distress becomes too severe, non-medical services should be available to facilitate self-healing and autonomy. The formal mental health services should treat the serious illnesses of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, melancholic depression, disabling anxiety, and serious personal, serious personal disorders with an adequate, or serious personality disorder, another typo, uh, serious personality disorders with an adequate ring-fenced budget. Well, read that one again. The, the five serious uh, conditions, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, melancholic depression, disabling anxiety, and serious personality disorders should have a ring-fenced budget and be treated by the formal mental health services. And now, these formal services will necessarily have a medical component, and that's usually more important in the acute phase of an illness. But much of the treatment by the formal mental health services should be in the community. It should be multidisciplinary in nature, and it should be individualized. The primary focus should be on context, meaning, relationships, and level of functioning. Less focus should be on accurate diagnosis and reflex pharmacological intervention. Recovery should be facilitated. So within the psychiatric profession, which I belong to, and outside it, there are already individuals and groups who are practicing in this manner and are already advocating for these measures to be adopted universally. And I think that's a cause for hope. Thank you.